and this morning we sort of took flight into the atmosphere. For the next little while, we're coming back to Earth gradually. So I'm going to talk largely about the terrestrial biosphere, but I'm going to be giving you mainly the kind of evidence base or the phenomenology of, of that in the first lecture. And that is actually largely to do with the atmosphere. And tomorrow in the uh, rather short track, uh, we're going to uh, explore the kind of methods that we've used to understand some of the really large scale features of the terrestrial uptake from the atmosphere. So here you see the, the kind of overall view of the three lectures I'm going to give. Um, as I said, the phenomenology of the carbon cycle first off with a particular emphasis on the, uh, the atmosphere, uh, largely talking about information we can get on the terrestrial biosphere because the ocean's been pretty well covered. In the second lecture, we're going to talk a lot about terrestrial modeling um, and especially some simple models because you'll need one of those for the frack this afternoon. It's kind of the analog of the ocean model that you're working with, I think, on Monday. And tomorrow, we're going to talk largely about carbon cycle climate feedbacks in models and data. Uh, and again, uh, that's going to have a slightly terrestrial focus, um, although not entirely. Um, oh, last warning. Um, it's quite common that I push that button twice or forget to push it or something, so I'm talking about something that's nothing to do with what you can see in front of you. If that happens, it's because I'm out of sync and somebody should tell me or will stay there for the rest of the, the, rest of the lecture. Um, so the outline of this lecture is a kind of a brief tour of the atmospheric, um, of atmospheric CO2. Uh, a look at the kind of global budgets of carbon. I think you've had a brief look at those already. Uh, and then we're going to try and extract some of the key features of the variations in CO2 and see what we can understand about their causes and what that might tell us about things we can expect to see in the future. And this is rather an evolving story. So the, the three kind of aspects of this, large long-term means, uh, variability and trends are all moving from stuff that we think we now know reasonably well through to stuff that we kind of are pretty confident about to stuff that's really quite new. Um, so the, the, the story about the trends is an absolute current controversy at the moment. Let's get a bit of time scale perspective here. And this you probably had a look at already, but talking about uh, glacial and glacial variations. This is a version, it's not the, the current one, it's not long enough, of the CO2 record uh, for long time scales from the Vostok ice core. Um, and uh, as you've heard about already, the basic story is pretty large variability, but most of it is kind of down below a plateau that sat around 280, 300 ppm kind of thing with large ex negative excursions mainly. Um, and there are um, strong associations with temperature and tomorrow we'll talk briefly about what we might be able to learn from that about some of the climate sensitivity of the whole system. But the, the general picture is that for the last, it's actually now I think 800,000 years or a bit longer, that 300 ppm has been something of a ceiling for atmospheric CO2. For the last millennium, and this is from a higher resolution ice core from Law Dome, um, life is very boring indeed um, until the start of the Industrial Revolution. CO2 was surprisingly stable in the atmosphere, uh, sitting again at around about 280 ppm with some relatively small variations. Uh, again, um, a couple of really interesting negative anomalies, uh, the strongest one around 1600. And uh, again, that can be used to try and learn something about the relationships between greenhouse gas concentrations and temperatures. Then more recently, um, one of the iconic figures, people call it, in global environmental science is the so-called Keeling curve. Um, of the variation in CO2 recorded at Mauna Loa, started in the late 1950s, um, still going now, actually still using the same instrument, which may or may not be a good idea, but the, the late Dave Keeling would absolutely determine that nothing would disrupt the sanctity of a uh, um, continuous, well-calibrated record uh, and managed to maintain uh, observations essentially on three year cycles of research funding for 50 years. It's an extraordinary bureaucratic as well as scientific achievement. Um, uh, now, of course, the, the whole thing has been much more widely taken up. It's rather an industry these days measuring CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, 
but the monolayer record is still the long-standing ICON. And when people say things like atmospheric CO2 passes 400 ppm, what they're talking about is that record. Um, and you see the, the, the features that everyone's noticed, an, an inexorable rise and an acceleration, really, of, of the uh, almost an exponential look about that curve. Monolower was the pioneer, um, although very soon thereafter, when the results were a surprise to Dave, uh, they started measuring at South Pole at almost the same time to see whether this was a, this rise that he was seeing over a couple of years was a local phenomenon or a global phenomenon. Now, the network of measurements um, is out of date every few weeks because the cost of deploying one of these things has come down from maybe half a million dollars to put a continuous analyzer in the field down to a few tens of thousands of dollars. And so there are hundreds of these around now. This picture lists about 120 that are um, gold standard measurements, well calibrated. Uh, on, on agreed international scale. So if, if you measure a difference between two stations, you're pretty sure it's real. Uh, and there, at the time this was done, uh, 2012, 2013, there are about 120 stations in that network. There are several hundred more now trying to estimate local sources and sinks. And, and um, several research groups represented in this room, including us at Melbourne, uh, own a few of these. Um, Network, as I said, is increasing rapidly. Almost all of it's in the wrong place because the network is increasing in places like rich uh, developed economies where we've got a pretty good shot at estimating the emissions anyway. Um, if you try and buy one of these for the Democratic Republic of Congo, I wish you the best of luck. Um, deploying it's even more interesting. So uh, there's been quite a bit of effort involved in finding other ways of making these measurements. And there are, for example, satellites flying that measure CO2 in the atmosphere now. So the, the observational coverage um, of these atmospheric measurements is pretty decent, but it's in the wrong places. Um, from that network, you can produce a plot um, that inside the business is usually called the flying carpet. Um, and it shows, in general, a plot of latitude and time with the CO2 concentration. Um, and so what you see, I hope, um, is a north-south gradient uh, because the CO2 concentration is these days higher in the northern hemisphere. We think we know why that's happening. Uh, a much larger seasonal cycle in the northern hemisphere um, because the seasonal cycle is largely driven by the unbuffered exchange of CO2 caused by from land plants um, and a fair bit of interannual variability, which we'll get to shortly. Um, and we're going to try and interpret some of the features of this diagram um, to tell us something about where the sources and sinks of carbon might be. We can also have a look at kind of the overall global integrated numbers um, for the global carbon budget. And this is uh, from a, a website called the Global Carbon Project, which puts these things together pretty much every year. So you can catch up with whether the emissions have gone up or down. Um, it's, that's been a pretty easy bet until recently. Um, and what that's, uh, how that's flowing through the atmospheric growth rate. And you can write a version of this budget that says that the dominant terms in the atmospheric budget of CO2 are the input from fossil fuels plus well, it's usually called land use change, occasionally deforestation, although it's not all one way. Um, and then the uptake from the oceans and the terrestrial. Now, there's a, it's, it's worth thinking about how well we know various of these terms. The growth rate's really well known because you take these 120 stations scattered around the Earth, you make up a global mean, and you take its derivative from year to year. And you can measure these things to pretty fine precision. Um, the... Fossil fuel is globally reasonably well known. It's actually getting less well known, which is a bit of a surprise, but as more and more emissions move to countries with less and less developed uh, national statistical apparatus, the uncertainty on the fossil fuel number is actually going up. Um, the land use is extremely controversial because it involves doing things like looking down and saying there was a forest here last year, it's gone this year, how much carbon was involved? 
Uh, and that's a really hard thing to do. Um, the ocean, well, probably reasonably well known, um, but um, there are people in this room that could answer that question in much more detail than me. It's derived from a mixture of models uh, and uh, a range of internal and external measurements of ocean carbon to give you a decent look at what the air-sea exchange might be. And the terrestrial, we haven't got a clue, so we make it up um, <laughs> by whatever's left over, we call that terrestrial. Um, and that's, that for globally, that's pretty much the state of the art for, for how terrestrial fluxes are estimated. I don't know how much detail there is on that plot, but I note here that 2011, uh, if you look at the terrestrial, was probably the biggest uptake number that we've ever seen uh, over the 50 odd years of this record. And it's still true that the, um, con the uh, concentration in the atmosphere went up. It's worth thinking briefly about what's the evidence we have about what causes the increase in CO2. We all take it for granted, and it, it turns out we're right, that this is driven by fossil fuel, but there are people around that doubt that, and it's worth noting what the evidence, the direct evidence for this actually is. Well, the first thing on the left there is a plot of oxygen, the oxygen concentration in the atmosphere. And uh, rather nicely, um, Dave Keeling pioneered the measurement of CO2 in the atmosphere to, to the precisions that we need. His son, Ralph, pioneered the measurement of oxygen um, in the atmosphere a few decades later. And when uh, a colleague of mine first saw this graph, came into the tea room and said, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is we found something whose concentration is going down in the atmosphere, and the bad news is it's oxygen. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, thankfully, it's not going down very much. Um, we have about 210-odd thousand ppm, 21%-odd worth of oxygen in the atmosphere, and the decrease is in the ppm range, so there's no particular concern about that, but it does tell us that there's some process going on that is removing oxygen from the atmosphere, and a likely candidate for that, of course, is, is some form of combustion. Um, and indeed, if you do the oxygen budget in some detail, it's impossible to explain that trend without some sort of combustion source. Okay, that's piece of evidence number one. Um, the other figure on the right is a more difficult one to, to uh, interpret and um, uh, analyze in detail, but it's a measurement of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope. Um, it's produced naturally uh, by um, cosmic ray impacts and various other things, various um, nuclear processes, including ours from time to time, at the surface of the Earth. In fossil fuel, it's completely absent because it's been sitting underground for many, many half-lives of C14, so that when you introduce fossil fuel into the atmosphere, the concentration, the, the relative abundance of C14 and CO2 goes down. And indeed, that's what it's been doing. You can measure this stuff in tree rings as it's um, incorporated uh, in plant growth, and you see that the concentration is decreasing. There are some almighty spikes of carbon-14 that have to do with um, various adventures in above-ground nuclear testing that we did through other. A fantastic tracer for the ocean, by the way, the nuclear tests. It's very hard to justify them on those grounds, um, <laughs> but uh, we kind of miss the tracer these days. Um, so uh, and there's also a plot that I haven't shown of carbon-13, which suggests that the new carbon that's going into the atmosphere is derived from something biospheric. We'll get back to carbon-13 a little later. So we've got something in the atmosphere which is, a, which is um, associated with combustion. It's a CO2 concentration that's rising. It's associated with combustion. It's old and it's biospheric. And that's pretty close to a smoking gun, I would have said, for fossil fuel. Um, now, how do we actually infer the terrestrial flux. We're now going to talk for a little while about um, evidence of, of, of the terrestrial flux. What can we actually do to try and uh, estimate what the terrestrial flux is? And there are really basically two methods, uh, which glory, unfortunately, in the names bottom up and top down, which is a terrible choice. But the, the, basically, the bottom up estimate is you make a bunch of estimates at a point, and you do this either with a model uh, where you can 
you can model it, things everywhere, right? It doesn't have to be true, but you, at least, you can at least do it everywhere. Um, you can use a bunch of estimates from data if you've got them. And there are, there are kind of this acupuncture series of people who measure fluxes at a point around the globe. There are several hundred of those as well on flux towers scattered across the landscape. And you can try and extrapolate those to the globe. It's hard. Uh, whatever you do involves some kind of model, either a statistical model to take your several hundred measurements and spread them across the globe, or a kind of mechanistic physical model of the sort we'll get back to in about an hour's time of uh, taking these point-wise modeled numbers and taking them up to the globe. Uh, it, 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 as I said, it always involves a model. It works really well at small scales. If you've got flux towers and you know that the landscape around your flux tower is pretty similar to where you were measuring, then you can have a decent shot at estimating the, the flux in that region. The top-down um, measurements that we'll largely talk about for the next little while, you kind of measure quantities that integrate the results of the flux. And of course, for us, that's atmospheric concentration. Uh, there are other things to do, but that's atmospheric concentration. Um, and potentially things like the isotopic um, abundance in CO2. We've already mentioned that for carbon-14. Uh, there are other things that might be traces of other processes like carbonyl sulfide turns out to be somewhat um, a tracer for photosynthesis. Oxygen we've already mentioned. And you work backwards from the structures of, the, of, the, of these things to try and infer the structure and of the variations in the fluxes themselves. Um, working backwards uh, here, it's what's called an atmospheric inversion. It's what I spend most of my time doing. Um, and it introduces all sorts of its own errors and problems. Uh, you'll see that this works best, or has traditionally been thought to work best at really large scales. So the um, bottom-up estimates work very well at very small scales. The top-down estimates work very well at very large scales. It turns out that a country where you might wish to make an estimate for kind of policy reasons of what the emissions for, I don't know, Germany or um, China or Australia or whatever actually are, is a, almost um, a dark zone in the scale gap between these two processes, which is a damn nuisance to the planet. Um, so trying to cross that scale gap, if you like, for these optimal scales has been something of a task in, in, in this science for the last couple of decades. Just revisiting that flying carpet, I hope. Now we're gonna try and start to discuss some of the, the, the drivers of the detail in this beast. So the first point, and it's the first thing we did discover uh, as, a, as a community, was the discovery of the terrestrial sink. Um, so I've shown the equation again there, growth is equal to fossil, land use change ocean and terrestrial. Um, and in the 1980s, courtesy of a, a range of methods to do with um, understanding the, the penetration of the bomb C-14 spike into the ocean, for example, um, some, some satellite and bookkeeping measurements of land use change, uh, and Dave Keeling's measurements at Mauna Loa that gave us the atmospheric growth rate pretty well. Um, we could estimate most of these terms pretty decently, and they didn't add up. Um, there was a pretty large extra sink uh, and a large argument that followed immediately. Um, so for a while, we thought that it may have been the ocean that was wrong. This was a, just the mid-1980s. The measurements were, were um, sparse uh, and some fairly um, heroic efforts were needed to understand uh, how the changes in C14 in the ocean might translate in, into uh, actual changes in CO2. So there was a chance that was wrong. Um, but uh, the smart money said that the terrestrial biosphere was playing a pretty strong role. And if so, what and where? Um, it was called the missing sink at the time. It was a terrible term. It wasn't missing. It weren't many places it could be. Um, it, it, it's still occasionally called the missing sink. Um, I'd say we found it several times over now, so there's now no longer an argument about where it's missing, it's an argument about who can claim it. Um, and, um, but the, the term you'll still hear used from time to time. So the technique that we use to isolate this and much of, much else of what follows, um, I call these atmospheric inversions and I'll try and explain these in one slide. Um, so basically, as I said, you use concentration, concentration measurements 
and models of atmospheric flow or atmospheric transport to kind of back calculate surface sources of sinks from gradients usually or temporal changes in the atmospheric concentrations. Um, because there aren't enough of these measurements and you might, and if there is in other information around like these flux towers or measurements of air sea um, exchange of, of, of CO2, you, it makes sense to start with the first guess. Um, doesn't make necessarily make sense to completely trust it, but it does make sense to start with the first guess of the fluxes. Um, use an atmospheric model and you compare the predicted concentrations with the observed. Uh, then there are statistical techniques you can use, and we'll see them um, in the track tomorrow, to optimally adjust these fluxes to improve the maps with the concentrations. Um, and I am um, skipping over a career's worth of detail as to how you actually do that. Um, and th th there are even arguments over the techniques. But that's roughly the idea, that you, you observe the concentrations, you use a model of the atmospheric transport, and you adjust the concentrations predicted by that model until you match the observations, and the things you adjust are the sources and sinks you put in. The kind of key example of this um, that emerged first at the very end of the 1980s um, was the first time that people could actually run models of the global atmosphere with CO2 in them and had enough observations of the uh, atmospheric concentration to make these adjustments. Um, and they, they, so what they did was exactly this. They took the fossil fuel and uh, their best guess at the ocean and the terrestrial exchange and so on, put them in the model, compared to the observations, and found out that the north-south gradient that you predicted with the model was far too large compared to what you saw in the observations. So you had a problem. Um, you could reduce, you could uh, introduce an extra sink into the northern hemisphere. And we said we were missing a sink, so that seemed the logical place to put it. If you did it entirely, it turns out that you um, had to do some work in order to match both the growth rate and this north-south gradient. So it turns out that you needed to adjust both the sink in the northern hemisphere and the sink in the southern hemisphere. So it's not to, to, to um, completely scrap the gradient. Um, now, that immediately posed a problem um, because uh, we were pretty sure that the northern hemisphere oceans were reasonably well measured. So we were missing a lot of carbon here. We were missing something like one petagram of carbon per year, um, or perhaps more, on a growth rate of two or three. So this, was a, this, this missing sink was large. Um, it was hard to put it all in the northern hemisphere ocean because that was pretty well measured as it was. So it just about had to go onto the land. And uh, when people made these adjustments, suddenly the overall global ocean uptake shifted from numbers that at the time were being predicted at kind of two and a half to three um, petagrams per year down to below one. And that was hard to believe. And it took us roughly a decade to sort through this problem. And this plot <laughs> represents something of a synthesis that we came to at the end of the 1990s, early in the 2000s, about that structure. And indeed, you'll be running this code that, that generated this plot tomorrow. Um, once upon a time, it took a serious computer. These days, if you're sufficiently bored, you could run it on your phone. Um, <laughs> uh, but so it's, it's roughly, it shows that in order to match the north-south gradient, you need a significant sink in the northern hemisphere, and you actually need to reduce the ocean uptake in the south from what was predicted at the time. Interestingly, uh, after we made that prediction, came back and looked at the, um, at the, the uh, when some particularly crazy oceanographers, probably some of whom might be in this room, um, started, decided to start sailing uh, far south in winter, they discovered that the seasonal cycle of air sea gas exchange wasn't necessarily what this uh, prior estimate had assumed, and you could, in fact, match largely this north-south distribution of the, of the, the sink in the ocean um, with the growth rate provided that you had this significant northern hemisphere sink over land. Now, I never checked that this plot actually fitted on the page. So if it does, it's more by good luck than good management. Um, it doesn't? Oh well. <laughs> in that case, I can make it up. Um, what this attempted to show was the next question we came to look at was variability. 
Uh, and you saw from the global um, budget before that the global growth rate is highly variable. And because we don't know what else to do, we ascribe all that variability to the terrestrial. That makes some assumptions. Um, we assume that the ocean isn't variable. And I should, at this stage, break off and say, I always get annoyed when people talk about the variability. Variability is always a function of frequency. So we're talking here about the kind of year-to-year -year or interannual variability that you can observe in the atmospheric record. There's no doubt that the ocean varies substantially on much longer timescales, possibly more than the terrestrial does. But for the, the, um, the purposes of the records we're looking at here, it's year-to-year. -year. So we assume in writing down the global budget that uh, the variation is largely driven by the terrestrial biosphere. That's done, was originally done, with almost no evidence. Uh, we didn't know where else to put it. So along with the missing sink, we had the missing variability, and the terrestrial was made this kind of bit bucket for both of these. Um, a little while later, people were able to make measurements of carbon-13 in the atmosphere. Carbon-13 is um, a tracer roughly of biospheric exchange. It's a bit more complicated than that on longer timescales, but from year to year, the variations in C13 look like the variations in the terrestrial biosphere. And what you might have been able to see on this graph, uh, it's measurements of CO2 and C13 taken from a single site, and they are strongly correlated. They uh, are strongly enough correlated that we get interested whenever their variations separate. Um, and so that would suggest that the variations in, a, um, in atmospheric CO2 correlate pretty well with the variations in a terrestrially controlled tracer. And so we have a pretty clear idea, we think, that the year-to-year -year variation of uh, CO2 growth rate is probably driven by the um, terrestrial biosphere on interannual frequencies. Now I'm going to come to the last bit of the talk, uh, which is also the largest bit because it's the new bit, um, where we talk a little bit about trends. Um, and this is a, a, a kind of current controversy. So the idea was to, was to lead you uh, as quickly as possible um, from stuff we know pretty well, uh, and that's almost of historical interest, through to stuff that's a controversy that's evolving kind of month to month. So let's revisit the global carbon budget. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk about the, some of the trends in, um, in these terms. Let's simplify that a bit, and let's try and relate the fossil fuel source to the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. So as I, to remind you, the growth we can get by essentially taking one year's concentration minus the previous year's concentration, or differentiating it if you're feeling fancy, and we can compare that with the anthropogenic inputs. And the anthropogenic inputs here are fossil fuel and uh, land use change. Uh, and my notes tell me they're in red. Um, and I've, I mentioned already these are also taken. This is essentially a distillation of the plot we were seeing before. Um, so what you see is that, sure, um, both of these are increasing up to a point. The fossil fuel, and, uh, but the, the separation between the two curves is getting larger. And that suggests that the global uptake of CO2 by the rest of the system is getting larger. Now, um, the question is, is that what we expect or is there some change in the underlying process that we might be able to explain, that might be able to explain this? And it's given that we're really interested in the growth rate, the relationship between the growth rate and the fossil fuel source is pretty direct policy importance. Um, there are kind of two standard models for in, in the, these simple kind of diagnostics for describing the atmospheric growth rate. And really both of them are due to Dave Keeling uh, in various, uh, various papers over the years. And one is the airborne fraction model. And it's really simple. It just says that the growth rate of atmospheric CO2 is equal to some fraction alpha uh, times the anthropogenic input. Um, and uh, it's um, a really simple, easy to grasp diagnostic of the, the change in um, the relationship between uh, CO2 inputs 
and CO2 residing in the atmosphere, remaining in the atmosphere. And uh, historically, and you can probably see from the, from the graph in the previous page, it's remained reasonably constant. Its changes over long time scales are slow enough that you can start a major fight about whether it's going up or down. And there was this really edifying academic argument um, over a series of papers starting at about 2007, 2008, which basically came down to a bunch of senior um, carbon cycle academics saying, yes, it is, no, it isn't, yes, it is, no, it isn't, um, over the question of, is the airborne fraction going up? So is more of the CO2 staying in the atmosphere? If it did, that would be something of a concern because our policy responses are predicated on knowing what that uh, airborne fraction is going to be. Uh, if that's wrong, then we ought to get worried. The other model, and I think it's a better model um, uh, for, um, for a range of reasons, uh, is to write a response model that says that the uptake by the system is proportional to some constant, which very imaginatively we call beta, uh, times the excess of CO2 over some natural equilibrium background. And we'll see tomorrow that that term beta also has its uses in kind of simple diagnostics of carbon cycle climate feedbacks. Um, but we think that quite a few of the processes, like uh, the SE exchange um, of CO2, might be sensibly modeled as driven by the differences between what's happening in the atmosphere and what's in the surface ocean, and that those differences probably look like the excess of CO2 over some natural background, at least on these timescales. And there's some expectation that, that similar processes might occur in the terrestrial biosphere. So um, the two models turn out to be equivalent um, if the, the, um, the world is very simple. Uh, and uh, let me just find my notes here. Yes, the um, turns out to be the, the um, Relationship is very, it's, um, it's very simple. Models turn out to be the same if the growth in the fossil fuel is explained by a single exponential. Um, now, what am I showing here? What's that title? Residual growth rates. So let me, let me just go back here. I think I've actually shown both models here too and shown that um, indeed the, the fit of these, the, the two models to these, um, the observed growth rates is pretty similar. And the reason for that is that in fact, indeed, the fossil fuel has traditionally been pretty close to a single exponential. So it's actually hard to distinguish these models until recently. Um, because showing uh, just two curves together can be hard to understand, we also show the residual um, for both models. And we show the observed growth rate minus at fit using either this airborne fraction or this beta model um, for the two cases. Um, and the most interesting thing here, which we won't go into too much in too much detail today, as I said, both models do pretty well. The most interesting thing here is that the amplitude of the residuals around those curves, so that the amplitude of these residual differences has increased a great deal. So something in the natural system is driving an increased variability in the carbon cycle. And that's, so uh, I think we've, we've talked about means, we've talked about variability, we're talking about trends. Probably the next topic is going to be trends of the variability. Why is this changing the way it is? And, uh, and it's a bit interesting because it might tell us that the carbon cycle is becoming more sensitive to climate change. Uh, that's, that's already been someone's interpretation of this result. So now uh, watch this space. Um, what we don't see, I think, looking at these plots is evidence of a long-term departure. So we've modeled these things with a single airborne fraction and a single beta. And if the airborne fraction is going up or down or something, we might expect to see a gradual movement of these residuals away from, from, uh, from zero. And we don't really, there's no strong evidence that it's changing. But the recent period, um, is still quite interesting. Uh, so the left shows the, the, um, the anthropogenic and the growth rate again, uh, and the right shows the residuals. So um, the left, as I said, suggests increasing uptake. Um, the right shows that most, as, as I said last time, is explained by simple response. 
but not all of it. Um, what we see in particular is a noticeable trend in the residuals for the last maybe 15 years of the record. It's interesting that it corresponds to the time that's been called the temperature pause, um, but it's, it's, it's quite unlikely to be related. Um, but there's also been not a pause in the CO2 growth rate at all, but at least an increase in the efficiency of the uptake, it would appear. Um, so that raises the question, do we actually have an increasing response? And for this, um, we actually need to, to use our beta model, which talks about the response of uptake to CO2. And we've got measured CO2, so we can see whether the uptake is increasing in line with a fixed beta model or whether, in fact, that efficiency might be increasing. So we show the residuals again. Um, now, the, res the mean of the residuals after 2002 is significantly negative. Um, and that also suggests that there's a drop-off, an increase in the uptake above what that model would predict. And we can also fit a trend after 2002. So we fit beta by actually fitting the trend in the uptake versus the trend in CO2. And if we do that fit now to subsets of the period, we see that the response that you'd suggest after 2002 is quite different um, from the, the long-term expectation. So if all we had was 15 years of records, we'd be thinking that the uptake, the efficiency of the uptake is substantially better, substantially stronger than what it's been for the previous 50 years. Now, uh, of course, there's quite a lot of statistics to do here to see whether that's actually an accident. These changes are short, just like changes in the temperature record that can be driven by some slightly slower oscillation that's hard to estimate with just 50 years of records. There's all sorts of possibilities for this. It's worth noting, by the way, that uh, from this, in these residuals with the new FET, 2011 no longer stands out as a particularly dramatic anomaly. So uh, one explanation for the big uptake in 2011 is it's something more like the new normal. If we want to try and work out what and where these changes might be happening, um, we need to get, go back to atmospheric inversions. So we don't have enough detailed atmospheric concentration observations to do this for a long period, but over the last 20 years, when you know, half of it we think is seeing this anomalous increase, we can run one of these inversions. And the first test we do is to see whether the total flux, which, which is, um, as we saw from the global carbon budget, is pretty close to an estimate for the growth rate that is inferred by the inversions is close to what we've actually observed in the atmosphere. And it turns out it's pretty good. Um, we see the black line from GCP and the blue line from the, from the inversion. Um, and we've adjusted the means so that they match. So don't, don't take any, any um, notice of the fact that they have the same mean. We made them have the same mean. But we do see pretty much the same kind of variability um, and um, the trend as well. So we think that we might be able to use these inversions which can match these trends to see what part of the world or maybe even what process is driving the trend. Um, this plot, so these, this is um, possibly an attempt to show too much information on one graph. So I'll talk you through a bit, of it in, a bit of detail. It shows, again, from one of these inversions, the regional land and ocean uptakes. And the way we, we traditionally divide these is into the northern hemisphere, which is roughly north of 30 north. Uh, the tropics, um, which you may notice, have grown slightly from 23 to 30. Um, and the southern hemisphere. And we show the land and the ocean separately. So um, just write this down, uh, check my numbers here. Um, so land is above and ocean is below. Um, and north is on the left, tropics in the middle, and um, southern hemisphere on the right. So the first thing to note is looking at the bottom graph, there's not much action for the ocean here. Um, there's no particular evidence of strong trends. Um, or of particularly strong variability around the trend. So that it, the inversion, uh, not necessarily for the best of reasons, is giving us the kinds of behavior that we thought we saw, that the variability from year to year in the ocean is relatively small compared to the land. 
We do see um, a slightly increased uptake in the Southern Ocean, um, which uh, is an interesting comment given that there's been several papers around that say we uh, should expect to see and perhaps are seeing decreased uptake in the Southern Ocean. So that's another fight to have um, over exactly what's happening here. Um, uh, but the real action on this plot is up above, where we do see really quite considerable variations in the land. We see a particularly strong trend in the Northern Hemisphere on the left. Um, and kind of if we define the variability as the variability, variability around these, these straight line fits, then the tropics really dominates the variability. And that's been a long-standing finding as well, that uh, when you actually run these inversions and try and isolate not only that the land is driving the variability, but what part of the land drives the ETA variability, it appears to be the tropics, the terrestrial tropics. And that's no surprise. The biggest um, driver of year-to-year -year variability in the things that plants care about most on these time scales, which is um, temperature and water, um, is driven by the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And if you draw a map um, of what parts of the world are most strongly affected by the, the uh, ENSO and overlay that with where the biosphere is most active, that the hotspot comes out to be the tropics. So um, it's, it's pretty well understood you can even see this in the global growth rates of CO2 that a lot of these spikes you see actually correlate pretty well with the ENSO events. Um, so, um, in fact, about 70% of the ETA variability in the global growth rate can be explained by these ENSO sensitive regions. Um, and we, the, talking about the ENSO sensitivity is something we'll come back to a little bit tomorrow. So, strong trends in the Northern Hemisphere land, large variability in the tropics, and not much action in the ocean. Now I'm going to break every rule of the seminar and show you a table, which usually causes a revolt. Um, um, so we've actually tried to summarize these responses and by calculating these beta factors for the uptake separately for all these separate regions. And you don't see much action for the ocean anywhere. And you see a strong and an increasing response in the northern uh, northern terrestrial regions. The response in the tropics is negative, which is interesting. So that, that would say that the efficiency of the tropical sink um, might be uh, decreasing, um, but that that trend is weaker now than it was um, historically in the last, we've broken this into two periods, and that response is a little weaker than it was uh, historically. So there's some evidence that the northern hemisphere and the tropics are fighting each other. Uh, and again, that's roughly what you might expect from some understandings of the terrestrial biosphere we'll come to shortly. Tropics in the Southern Hemisphere are very hard to separate. And I mentioned already, there's not enough measurements in the right places. And not enough measurements means that regions are hard to distinguish. And that's a classic problem between the, the tropical land and the Southern Hemisphere land. Uh, and you can understand that pretty clearly looking at that network plot we saw earlier. Um, So we think we see a significant response in the Northern Hemisphere extratropics in the land. Um, another table, we've divided this flux so far into regions, but we can also divide it into times because the inversion calculates the uptake for every month. So we can ask whether the monthly responses, whether part of the annual response is driven by particular parts of the seasonal cycle and whether they have a different response to uh, CO2. And indeed, it turns out to be the case that at least for this pretty short inversion, that the response in the uh, global terrestrial uptake is not only confined to the Northern Hemisphere, it's confined to the Northern Hemisphere summer. Uh, and that's also been, uh, plays into something of a long-standing argument in, uh, among the uh, terrestrial carbon cycle community where there was a very well-known paper a few years ago that said, yeah, we, we expect an increase in summer uptake, uh, and that's largely informed by satellite observations that show this really strong trend in greening um, if, of the Northern Hemisphere. But the expectation from those guys was that it would be pretty much compensated by the fact that most of this stuff would come back in autumn as those new leaves, that those extra leaves that are growing as the Northern Hemisphere greens affect 